Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to seminar five of our water quality improvement plan review seminar series. Today we're going to be talking about our reef water quality targets. Um, my name is Maria Rosier and I work in the Queensland Government Department of Environment and together with our colleagues in the Federal Department of Environment, we're reviewing the plan. Um, presenting with me today is Carl Mitchell, who is a genius when it comes to water quality targets. So you're in for a really, really good presentation today. Um, just before we kick off, I thought I'd just do a bit of a recap. This is seminar five in our journey. Um, so just a bit of a reminder for those who have attended other seminars where we've been and for those who haven't, just to give you a bit of where we're at in the journey. So seminar one, I spoke about what's the current water quality improvement plan, what are the bits in it under review, and what we're hoping to achieve with the review of the plan, a bit on process and timelines, as well as the engagement process. And um, so we're trying to look at a more holistic and inclusive narrative to improving the water quality that flows from our catchments to the reef um, and really exploring, you know, the connection between communities, healthy or resilient landscapes or catchments and the water um, for that healthy reef. Um, in terms of process, we're still in the listening phase. So what we're doing is doing a number of seminars where we're um, giving people information to help them engage with us in the journey. We also have a survey available at the moment um, where we're also trying to listen to um, the aspirations and the views of reef communities. Following the listening phase, we'll be developing and drafting a plan. Um, we expect to also be holding information sessions or seminars or engaging um, throughout that phase before a public consultation um, on a draft plan early next year. Um, in seminar two, we spoke about the projects, the wide, wide range of projects that um, have been funded under the current water quality improvement plan. And I think for me, a really big key part of that is the number of humans engaged throughout our programs and projects and how that collaboration, partnership, and local-led planning really plays a key role in what we're trying to achieve. Um, seminar three, we spoke about the wetland strategy, the Great Barrier Reef wetland strategy, and how um, that's a really important part of the puzzle when we talk about ecosystem function. And also about the review of the urban water quality, tar uh, the, sorry, the urban targets, which is really what's the thinking around how the urban sector um, can play a really key role in ensuring um, healthy catchments for a healthy reef. Seminar four, we did a pass the baton. If you were there, it was um, fast and very informative. We spoke about our catchment targets, so wetland, ground cover and riparian extent, as well as our agricultural management practice adoption targets and our human dimension targets. So we're kind of trying to uh, give everybody an overview around what bits of the puzzle are being reviewed that will come into this new holistic and um, inclusive narrative that we're trying to create. So today we'll be talking about the water quality targets. Um, so before I pass the baton to Carl, I would like to do an acknowledgement of country. Um, I'm in Yagara and Turbo country in Mianjin, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present. And I'd like to extend my acknowledgement to reef traditional owners and really acknowledge that connection between land and sea country and the importance of holistic, how how the system works as a whole and how we um, need to manage systems from a whole perspective. Um, if you're um, a First Nations participant on the call today, I would like to also extend my acknowledgement to your elders, your culture and your story. 
So I'll pass, I'll pass on to Carl. Now I'll come back at the end to sort of talk about how the water quality targets fit in within policy context before we kick off to our questions and answers. Very good. Thank you, Maria, and welcome everybody. Um, as Maria said, I'm going to talk about water quality targets today. Um, so a key feature of a water quality improvement plan are these water quality load reduction targets for each of the 35 river catchments for drain into the Great Barrier Reef. Um, they were set in 2017 um, based on a range of technical work, which we'll have a look at some of that. Um, and they were set as ecologically relevant targets. And that was the first time in the history of um, water quality improvement plans and reef water quality protection plans and other planning instruments for the, around the reef that we were looking at ecological relevance as far as setting water quality targets. So what do we mean by ecological relevance? Um, Emma, we just get you to go to the next slide. So, in the setting of the targets in 2017, we we, we determined two thresholds in the inshore marine environment, uh, where if you were under that threshold, um, the coral and seagrass were healthy and under less stress, which over that threshold you were starting to see shifts of ecosystems. And those thresholds were around chlorophyll, which is um, the amount of green um, that's in the inshore environment, and that's driven by nutrients and particularly dissolved in organic nitrogen, um, and around light, the amount of light that's able to pass through, uh, and that's driven a lot by sediment and how much sediment is sloshing around in that inshore area. So in 2017, we set guidelines based on a chlorophyll threshold of 0.45 micrograms per litre in for uh, inshore waters, and we set a we set guidelines based on a light threshold of um, six moles of light at the at the bottom at the benthic level. So all of our targets that were developed are based on what load reduction from the catchments is required in order to maintain water quality in the inshore marine environment where that catchment water gets to, where the river water gets to, uh, less than those thresholds. And so that's how the targets have been derived. So if we go to the next slide. One of the key distinctions of the targets is their load reduction targets and they're targeting the anthropogenic load. So they're targeting the, the man-made, the human influence as far as increased load reductions coming from catchments since development of the catchments occurred. We're not trying to hit um, those natural loads or the pre-development loads. It's really only that anthropogenic, the human-induced increase in loads that we're trying to... Um, so whenever those load, the targets are articulated as 60% or 20%, it's of that anthropogenic load. So the graph here is from our catchment modelling team, and it shows the full 28-year um, cycle, climate cycle that we run our model on. And you can see that both the natural load and the anthropogenic load jump around um, because of rainfall and other climate conditions. And what we're trying to tackle through the targets are the, that orange area. And the light orange is showing year on year some of the predictions in what in changes in land management uh, are giving us as far as load reductions in the anthropogenic load. So the point of this slide is to show that it's not we're not trying to touch any of the natural loads, it's just the human-induced load that we're trying to achieve um, a reduction in through these targets. So we go to the next slide. So how do you go about improving water quality? Well, there's a national framework called the National Water Quality Management Strategy um, that articulates how you would go about setting up, uh, how you go about improving water quality um, from man-made influence in catchments. It's administered by um, a couple of committees. You've got the National Water Quality Management Strategies initiated by the National Water Reform Committee and the Water Quality Policy Subcommittee. 
and they set up a process for how you'd go about improving water quality in a catchment. It describes the development of a water quality improvement plan and what sorts of things should be in a water quality improvement plan. And it also encompasses the Australian and New Zealand um, water quality guidelines for Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, marine water quality guidelines, and the Queensland water quality guidelines. So they all sit underneath this national strategy. And the national strategy has this great wheel with 10 steps of how do you go about improving water quality. It gets a bit complicated, so I've got a simple version here, um, which is just basically you look at your current understanding of the catchment and where, where water quality is. You look at the environmental values and what type of um, things you're trying to protect, um, drinking water, uh, ecosystem health, but um, amenity and um, any sort of values that you might place on the use of that water. Then you look at water quality objectives. So what sort of water quality would be required to maintain those values in a healthy state? And then you start setting targets and implementation strategy around what sort of things you're gonna put in place and where do you wanna be, how do you wanna, where do you wanna be as far as water quality um, over time? To support those values. So that's the national framework. Um, it's been in place for many years uh, and it articulates how you go about improving water quality and targets are a key part of that national framework. So if we go to the next slide, the national framework defines the targets. Um, they have to be numeric targets. They're protecting environmental values. They need to be achieved within a certain time frame um, and I have to regard where you're currently where you're starting from as far as water quality and the longer term trends where you want to be um, and those climatic signals that we talked about in that earlier slide as well. So targets are important because if we don't have something to shoot for, if we don't know what type of water quality we, we need to support those um, inshore marine environments, then we we don't know whether um, we're having an impact or not. So the targets tell us what is required in order to achieve healthy ecosystems in the inshore marine environment. And then we need to look at implementation strategies through things like the Water Quality Improvement Plan to say, well, what sort of things are we gonna put in place to achieve those targets? And those targets have been communicated um, by the Australian and Queensland government through the Water Quality Improvement Plan, and they're picked up by um, the international committees such as United Nations um, and others, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So if we go to the next slide, there's a history of water quality targets in the Great Barrier Reef. Um, starting way back in 2003, there was an attempt to set water quality targets. So as long as we've had policy around water quality improvement um, right back um, to 2003 and even earlier, there's been attempts to look at well, what sort of targets should we be aiming for in improving water quality. And those early targets were single numbers for the whole of the Great Barrier Reef. They weren't specific to catchments and they weren't specific to um, ecosystems and what was required for ecosystem health. But over time, we've, through the iterations um, and improvements in targets, we've seen um, better methods for deriving targets, better methods for monitoring and reporting water quality. The targets have become finer scale. So instead of one size fits all for the Great Barrier Reef, we've got these 35 um, catchment targets and the targets have become based on what the ecosystems require and we've got a greater confidence in those numbers. So every time we've reviewed and updated the targets, um, they've gotten, the methods behind them have gotten better. Um, they've become more ecologically based and we've got greater confidence in those targets based on the science behind them. We go to the next slide. So the current targets sit within the framework of a water quality improvement plan. And what you, you see here is the um, program logic that sits behind the water quality improvement plan. We're at that high level outcome by 2050. We're trying to achieve a state where good quarter, water quality sustains the outstanding universal value of the Great Barrier Reef. It builds resilience improves ecosystem health and benefits communities. And if you can see right in the middle of that is uh, in, in the light blue other water quality targets. It's a very, the linchpin sort of what we need to achieve to be able to support water quality on the Great Barrier Reef. And this is really critical um, because there are multiple factors that affect the health of the Great Barrier Reef and water quality is just one of those. Um, 
But by improving water quality and by supporting those inshore marine environments, we're giving them um, the best chance of being able to be resilient to some of these other drivers that are coming as far as climate change and direct use and other impacts on the Great Barrier Reef. So this plan is currently under review and um, I'll just, so if we go on, yep. So the water quality targets, we've, as I said, they've been set for each of the 35 river basins. They focus on some of the key pollutants that we're concerned about within the inshore areas of a Great Barrier Reef, that being dissolved in organic nitrogen. And it's a ready form of nitrogen that's able to be taken up quickly by uh, algae and um, transformed very quickly once it gets into the marine environment. It, it can cause um, overgrowth of those things, which shifts the balance from coral um, towards algal reefs. And then we also have targets around fine sediment, um, which can smother, which can degrade the light in that inshore area and mean that uh, there's less light available for seagrass and coral. We have also have targets around particulate phosphorus and particulate nitrogen. There are other nutrients that can be transformed uh, once they get into the marine environment and can shift the system out of balance. So we set those for the 35 river basins and then we roll those up into each of the, reef, the six reef regions and we roll that up again for the whole of the reef. Um, and that's for reporting purposes so that when we're reporting to the Australian and Queensland government, um, we can report at the whole of reef scale as well as the regional scale and uh, catchment scale. Obviously, when we set the targets, um, the ecological basis of setting those targets is at the catchment scale. So they're most relevant. Um, these targets are most relevant at the individual catchment scale. So if we go to the next slide. So these are those rolled up targets and um, the Australian and Queensland government have made a commitment to UNESCO. And I had to write out what UNESCO means for United Nations Education, Scientific and Cultural Organisation um, to review these targets and update them to 2030. And um, that's part of a, the World Heritage Conventions and the World Heritage Committee underneath the UNESCO, but the Australian and Queensland government are both reporting to that. So we have the, tar the current targets for the whole of a reef are a fine sediment reduction of 25% by 2025, dissolved in organic nitrogen 60% reduction by 2025, particulate nutrients 20% reduction, and pesticides are maintained um, to protect 99% of aquatic species. So far, through our reporting, we've seen 16% reduction in fine sediment, a 28.4% reduction in dissolved inorganic nitrogen, um, and 15.4 and 18.5 respectively in particulate nitrate and particulate phosphorus. And um, aquatic species protection is sitting around 95%. So they're the current targets, and they're currently under review. So that review is being undertaken by Jane Waterhouse and her team at Sutuo Consulting. Um, and we're about halfway through the review of those targets. So we go on to the next slide. The scope and approach for the review is that we are looking at all of the, the river basin targets for sediments, for um, dissolved in organic nitrogen, for particulate nitrogen and particulate phosphorus. Um, the review was to look at um, what is required as far as the ecosystem threshold, whether there was any new information pertaining to what those thresholds are, uh, the time frame required to maintain to achieve those targets in order to maintain the health of the inshore environments. Um, and we've asked for review if there's not a big change in the in the targets required to consider whether it's sufficient to um, maintain the existing targets. They need to report the confidence in those numbers um, and present some ideas of how the best way to present the targets. So that's the scope of the project. The things that are out of scope, um, the assessment primarily, the, the new information that's available for this review of the outputs of the catchment and the e models. So that's going to be a main, that has been 
the ma a main focus of the review. Um, the review is not revising the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park water quality guidelines that were set in 2010. It's outside the scope of the review. However, the information and the, the, the data that we've gathered as part of this review um, would be a great input into a review of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park water quality guidelines. Um, we're not looking at setting any other water quality targets as part of this process. Um, and we're not reviewing the pesticide target. It's still it's still relevant. And it um, the pesticide target, uh, the way that the metric around pesticide uh, impact is assessed, it actually includes uh, ecosystem uh, impacts. So it's, uh, it's still up to date and there was no need. It was not seen that there was a need to update the pesticide target. So if we go to the next slide, this is the current review. We're about halfway through it. Uh, we've just had the independent science panel um, review some of the early outputs of the review. We're looking to produce a, um, a report in September this year, which will then feed into the water quality improvement plan processes um, and then be released as part of a, the water quality improvement plan sometime next year. Um, we have formed a technical advisory group to advise us on this process and give us input. Um, and we also have the independent science panel that do a, the higher level review of all of the outputs of our water quality targets review. So if we go to the next slide, that'll show us um, the technical advisory group have been tasked with um, reviewing the ecosystem thresholds, um, helping us to select, helping the project to select e-reef model scenarios, reviewing the method for how we define where the water gets to, so the river footprints, um, reviewing the timeframes to achieve the targets, um, setting some rules around whether we need to adopt new targets or whether the current targets are sufficient, um, guiding our methods, uh, guiding the interpretation of the ERIS output, and um, helping us to come up with a way of communicating and the confidence around the results. So that group has met a couple of times. Now we've got one or two more meetings to go um, in finalising the report, but that's been, they've had some really good insight into the technical elements of the review. So the, the main driver, as I said, behind the review of the, the, the greatest wealth of new information and new data has come from updates of the, the models that sit underneath the method for developing water quality targets. So there have been some major updates to the catchment models um, and the paddock models from the paddock to reef integrated monitoring, modeling and reporting program. Um, and so they, they've upgraded their hydrology, they've got new land use data, they've got new soils data, they've got a new um, gully and stream bank components to their models. So there's a whole heap of new information that have gone in to the catchment models, and with any models, the better your, your input information, the better your models perform. And so we've got much higher confidence in these new models. Um, and that, as part of our improvement over time, the models are getting better, the data that we put into the models is getting better, and our confidence is increasing. And the same if we go onto the ERIS model in the next slide, um, when we are in the the earlier versions of the model, there were 39 coastal inputs, and now we're looking at 109, um, and we're covering 90% of the of the flow. Um, so there's a lot more information going into these marine models now um, as well. So there's been some major improvements. So not all of those 109 coastal inputs are Great Barrier Reef rivers, um, so the model is much bigger than that. But um, we're, we're modelling now 61 rivers going into the Great Barrier Reef. So if we go to the next slide, it um, gives us a bit of a snapshot of what's different between the last time we looked at the targets and this time. So in the 2017 review of targets, we were modelling 17 coastal river inputs. This time around, we've got 63. Um, there were three years worth of marine modelling in the 2017 setting of targets, there's now 11 years of modelling. Um, the catchment model was the 2013 version. We've now got the 2022 version. 
and we're, we're still reviewing the thresholds, no change to the um, contaminants, the pollutants that we're looking at, uh, and no change to the scale of which we're looking at them. So significant new information has gone into the review of these targets, and we'll be looking at coming up with our reporting for that to feed into the Water Quality Improvement Plan late September this year. So the way that we then report against those targets once we've um, once they've been set is through the Paddock to Reef Integrated Monitoring, Modeling and Reporting Program. And we've got a couple of seminars coming up over the next few weeks that outline the Marine Monitoring Program and the Paddock to Reef Program that show that go into detail on how data is collected, how we um, evaluate that data and the reporting within the Reef Water Quality Report Card. So uh, get in and register for those seminars um, with lots of information on how the monitoring, evaluation and reporting for the reef occurs. And there's some really interesting stuff there. Um, and then I'll hand over, hand back to Maria. Thanks, Carl. Um, that's such a great overview of the water quality targets. Um, and I guess in addition to them being quite important in our planning prioritization and um, investment of water quality improvement projects, um, they've also been used to inform policy decisions. So I thought I'd just capture um, how those targets have been used in policy and legislation in Queensland um, before we get to our questions and answers time. Um, so in terms of the, the Environmental Protection Act framework, those water quality targets were used to create end of basin water quality objectives under the Environmental Protection, Water and Wetland Biodiversity um, Policy 2019. So that document prescribes environmental values um, that the state protects in Queensland and it sets water quality objectives which then inform decision making. Um, we then it prescribes that document, which is called the Great Barrier Reef and of Basin Load Water Quality Objectives, and we'll add those links into the chat um, in a bit. So the environmental protection policies and its statutory documents, such as the GBR end of basin objectives, are then used to inform decisions. So under the Environmental Protection Act, um, activities. They're called environmentally relevant activities. They range from sewage treatment plant, aquaculture, quarries, mining, petroleum activities. They are licensed under the Environmental Protection Act. Sorry, Emma, the last one, uh, the one before, please. Um, they're licensed under the Environmental Protection Act under an environmental authority. In considering whether to issue and whether to impose conditions on those environmental authorities, the administering authority then consi considers um, the environmental values under those environmental protection policies, including the GBR uh, end of basin water quality objectives. In addition to um, our licensing framework under the Environmental Protection Act, then we jump to the, the Planning Act, which is where development um, is decided in Queensland. So the Planning Act, next slide please, Emma. Uh, the Planning Act provides the framework for planning decisions um, in Queensland from um, development assessment to our planning instruments such as regional, um, regional plans, local government plans. Under the Planning Act, the state planning policy brings together, it integrates what the state planning interests are and then leads to planning in an integrated way. So when we think that planning needs to deliver to livable communities, uh, regional opportunities, to environmental values, we have that document that brings everything together. In terms of the GBR and a basin load objectives, they are then listed as a state interest in those um, in that state planning policy. So what it means is when the state does planning, such as regional plans, um, we the state must consider how for uh, future development and planning for, for regions 
protects state interests such as the end of basin load water quality objectives. Um, so that's in a, in a nutshell how the water quality targets then translated to um, our policy and legislation environment in Queensland. Um, this is where we will stop the recording and have a moment to really have a conversation and, and have some questions and answers. So please feel free to pop your 